Um, we don't usually do this, but I want to begin today's sermon by reading our passage first. So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to please turn to Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. And I believe if you have a Bible from church, or at least the one that I'm using, it's on page 975. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. And the passage for today is verses 1 through 5. And when you're there, um, just so I can get an idea of who's there or who's not, um, I want to invite you when you're ready and if you're able to stand up as a sign of reverence for God's word. So if you're there, you can feel free to stand up. And we do this as a sign to know that we're hearing not from me, but from God himself this morning through his word. Look down with me at the passage. This is God's word for you this morning. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Amen. You may be seated. Now, I want to first focus on the first verse. So if you look down with me, it says, you who are spiritual. Paul is talking to the one who is spiritual. Now, what does it mean to be spiritual? I think this is one of the words where we kind of hear it a lot, especially in church. But if asked to define what it means, we might have a difficult time doing it. Does it mean you're super religious and you don't enjoy anything in life, like monks or nuns at a monastery? Or does it mean you're very disciplined in your personal quiet times, reading the Bible and praying each day, not missing a day? Or does it mean you frequently have certain experiences relating to faith that others don't? Maybe you go on a lot of missions trips. Maybe you serve a lot at church. Maybe you're more charismatic and you seek to speak in tongues or something like that. But according to Paul, in the book of Galatians, it's none of these things that make someone spiritual. The spiritual person, as you heard in last week's sermon when Ricky preached for us, is the one who bears the fruit of the Spirit. The spiritual person is the one who bears the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And if you look more carefully at each of these qualities, you're going to notice that someone cannot prove to be these things if they live by themselves, right? These qualities can only grow and they can only be proven in the context of relationships, in the context of families, communities, church. Let me explain what I mean. For example, how do you know someone is a loving person or a kind person or a faithful person? It's by how they relate to other people. It's by how they treat others. A loving person will be willing to sacrifice of themselves to help someone else. A non-loving person, they would hear someone needs help, but they would be stingy with their time, resources, money. A kind person would be careful with their words, wanting to help other people to know the love of Christ. An unkind person would not care how their words affect others, and they would not care if they hurt other people. A faithful person is committed to the people around them. An unfaithful person is not. So I hope you can see that the qualities of the fruit of the Spirit, you can only know that in the context of some sort of relationship or community. But you know, even though Paul lists all these things in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 23, these are somewhat general or abstract, meaning it's hard to make it specific to you unless you really think about it. And maybe the Apostle Paul, he knew that. Maybe he knew that. Because fortunately for us today, he gets a lot more specific about what it looks like to be a spiritual person, someone who's bearing the fruit of the Spirit. And today, if you're taking notes, this is the question that we'll be answering. What does the truly spiritual person look like? 
what does the truly spiritual person look like? And if you're taking notes, then I would encourage you to write this down. The truly spiritual person humbly cares for others. The truly spiritual person humbly cares for others. And they do this in two ways. The first way is to gently restore another Christian who is in sin. Look down again at verse one. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression or sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. The first way the Christian cares for others is by restoring other Christians who are in sin. Now, before we continue further, we need to clarify what Paul means when he refers to someone who is caught in sin. What does that mean? Because on the surface, a person who's caught in sin, it seems to be someone who literally gets caught red-handed in the middle of doing something they shouldn't be doing. And maybe we can relate to that. You know, when I was younger, I would sneak um, my Game Boy, not a Nintendo DS, not even a Game Boy Advanced, not even a Game Boy Color, a Game Boy, period. Maybe some of you don't even know what that is. A Game Boy under my covers to play a little bit more past my bedtime. And it's funny because from someone that's maybe looking from the corner of my room as a fly on the wall, you see this big lump in the dark with the light shining through the blanket. I don't know what I was doing. I should just play it outside of my covers anyway. Sometimes I would get away with it, but other times my mom, she would walk in, she would see this huge lump underneath the covers, she would maybe see a light coming out of it, and then without me knowing, she would pull the covers off really quickly and catch me in my deception. But I don't think this is what it means to be caught in sin in our passage. Why? Because of the way Paul says to restore them. If you keep your eyes on verse one, if you look down, it says to restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Gentleness will not work for someone who is deliberate, purposeful, habitual, unregretful in their sin, even when they're confronted about it. Gentleness is not the right ingredient for that situation. In that situation, discipline and firmness would be better. So what does Paul mean when he refers to someone who's caught in sin? He's referring to the Christian who is unexpectedly overtaken by sin. He's talking about the Christian who wants to live for God, but falls in a moment of weakness. He's talking about the Christian who generally wants to do what is right as a way of pleasing God, but finds himself caught in the thorns of sin. This is an important reminder that a healthy Christian is not a morally perfect Christian because no one can ever be morally perfect. A healthy Christian is the one who is sensitive to their sins and wants to be holy, meaning they no longer want to sin because of what Christ has done for them. Paul is saying, if you see someone who wants to live for God, who is of Christ, who has given their lives over to God by trusting in what Jesus has done, but they're being overcome by sin, they need help. They need you to step in and gently restore them. And this goes against our immediate instincts, doesn't it? Because sin makes you uncomfortable. When you see someone behaving in a way that's destructive towards others and themselves, or it's in a way that makes you feel uncomfortable, you don't wanna go towards that person. In your discomfort, you seek an easy way out. Or if it's your friend who's sinning, you don't want to disrupt that relationship or friendship that you have. You don't want to be seen as some sort of prude. The easy thing would be to ignore the sin or push the person away. And what's worse is sometimes we say that's the more loving thing to do. We may say things like, I'm sinful too. How could I judge someone else who is in sin? You rationalize ignorance when in reality, you lack faith and courage to believe that helping someone, restoring someone from their sin is the most loving thing you can do for them in that situation. Now, if that sounds really difficult to do, let me ask you, can you imagine if this is how Jesus treated us when we were in sin? I mean, think about it. 
he should be the only person that should be distancing himself from sinners because he's sinless, whereas we're sinful. If there's anyone who should be uncomfortable with sin because of their own holiness, it should be Jesus. But rather than go away, he draws near. He stooped down from heaven into earth to live among his creation, experiencing everything we face in life, hardships, temptations, physical weakness, pain, and even death. And yet he never sinned. And rather than pointing to his sinlessness as a way of making us feel further shame and guilt for our own sins on the cross, he died for us on the cross. That was the purpose of the cross, not to bring further guilt and shame, but to bring freedom and joy. Rather than seek an easy way out, Jesus chose to die for you and me. And if you believe in this message, which is called the gospel, and you're okay with ignoring the sins of others or foregoing it, rather than gently restoring them, then I wanna ask you, are you okay with that? Or more harshly, can feel more harsh, how can you live like that? What's your reasoning or basis for being able to live like that even after you've claimed to experience something as wonderful as forgiveness and being restored yourself by Jesus? Don't ignore the sin in your life. Don't ignore someone else's sin. Big or small, we must learn to help each other take off our sin and put on righteousness. And I get it, maybe sometimes you've tried this. Maybe you see a friend who needs your help, but your intentions to be loving were not made clear and they received it harshly and they felt like you were just condemning them then I want you to focus on the second part of verse one where it says, restore them in a spirit of gentleness. Are you approaching your friend or the other person in church or the Christian to just point out that they're wrong because you feel better than them when you do that? Or is it because you truly love them and you want them to know more of the mercies of God through you? Be gentle in your spirit as you do this. Rather than letting your failures to live out this passage in the past, letting that discourage you from ever trying again, let your failures actually encourage you to grow in godliness in yourself so that you can learn to be gentle without compromising on biblical truth. Now, it's funny, right? We as Christians, we should be accepting. If you noticed, I said restoring other Christians when they're in sin. Does that mean we don't care about non-Christians? Not at all. Because you see, non-Christians, they need more than ever to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. They need to know that. But without knowing that first, they cannot be restored. They need to have a reconciled relationship with God first. And the way we do that is we proclaim the gospel with the hope that they would put their faith in Christ first. So if you're asking yourself or you're being critical here, then I wanna say you're right. We do care about non-Christians, but the way, way we care for them is different. And we'll talk about that in a future sermon. Restoring someone in their sin with gentleness is a sign of a truly spiritual person. And this is the first way Paul instructs the Galatians to care for each other in this passage. Now, the second way the truly spiritual person cares for others is to bear other people's burdens. A burden is something that can't be held by just one person because it's too heavy. Now, an idea of this could be we just went to retreat not too long ago, and when we get out of the bus, when we get to the retreat site, there's just so much luggage, so many snacks. If one of us were to do that all, that would be a heavy burden. Maybe realistically we can, but it would take forever. Because of sin and how it brings chaos into our world, all of us will fa face difficulties and burdens. We will all have burdens that are too hard to bear. And if you have yet to come across one in life where life just feels so good and you never recognize when you might be suffering, then I'm gonna guarantee that you eventually will suffer in this life. It's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Burdens come in many forms. You won't always get what you want, even if you do everything right. 
That means some of you won't get into the college of your dreams or have the lifestyle that you always dreamed of. Some of you may have financial troubles down the line or even now that cause immense stress on you and your family. Some of you will have conflicts in your relationships, whether it be among family or friends. Some of you will face seasons of great anxiety and depression, seemingly without explanation. Some of you will be hurt by other people. Some of you will face loss that is too difficult to bear. And these are definitely not all the burdens out there, but you get the picture, right? Life is hard. There's so many burdens to bear, but there are those that are too great for one person to bear on their own. Look down at verse two. And that's why here in verse two, Paul says to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. If you've been with us in our Galatians series, maybe you remember from Galatians chapter five, verse 14, Paul says the law of Christ is fulfilled when you love your neighbor as yourself and you serve them. Loving your neighbor is such a broad idea, but it's here in verse two, if you look down again, that Paul gets more specific. He gets concrete. What does it look like to love your neighbor as yourself? What does it look like to serve them? Bear their burdens. Bear their burdens. You see your classmate who's struggling in the class you're excelling in? Spend time to help them understand that material. You see that student no one wants to be around because they're socially unaware and awkward or maybe even mean? Go be their friend. Did you notice your mom or dad being short with you at the dinner table more than usual? Don't take personal offense. Go out of your way to ask them what might be happening in their life and offer to help around the house. Does your brother or sister annoy you on purpose? Don't fight back. Humble yourself and serve them. If you haven't noticed, bearing one another's burdens is not something you naturally want to do. It's not only hard, but a lot of times it's very thankless. The very people you try to help, they don't always understand how much time, sacrifice, money, energy goes into it. In fact, they may assume you should act that way. After all, you are a Christian, right? You should be doing that for me. And on the other hand, I wanna encourage maybe those of you who want to do this, you wanna bear other people's burdens, but you have so many burdens yourself. And you're asking, how can I love others when I myself am weighed down, when I'm tired? Well, I'm gonna give you another way to love others. And this might sound counterintuitive, but here it is. The way you love others is you share your burdens. You ask for help. Now, how is this loving? How is keeping our burdens on someone else loving? Well, we can't know one another's burdens without sharing about it. And we can't bear one another's burdens without knowing about it. And you sharing your burdens with someone else and taking that chance, it gives the church opportunity to live out Galatians chapter six, verses one through two. And so what does this look like? Maybe right now you're here, you're going through something no one else knows about and you've been trying to go through it whether it's related to your life, school, maybe even your faith. But maybe rather than making you go through it alone, God has gifted you this church, gifted you with such teachers and pastors and parents and friends to share your burdens. And so if you're here and you feel like your burdens are distracting you from loving others, I wanna really encourage you to share your burdens with those that you trust, give opportunity for us to love one another and fulfill the law of Christ. If it weren't for this, I actually would not be a Christian. It was only when I admitted that I need help, when I had so many doubts in my faith, and I shared that with my pastor, I shared that with my friends, that they were able to care for me, that they were able to bear my burdens with me, they were able to walk with me and lead me towards Christ. 
And so that's the hope. That's the hope that we would lead one another towards Christ. Now, going back to being the person bearing other people's burdens and being taken advantage of. First, I want to say it's not okay for people to take you for granted. It's totally understandable why you would make it, why that would make it harder and harder to bear someone else's burdens. But that's why it's crucial to remember who you're living for, why you were created. You weren't created for the applause and the approval of people. You were created for the glory of God. You were created not to bring honor to your own name, but to God's name, to make not yourself known, but to make God known. And without a proper God-centered view of life, you will not be able to bear the burdens of others in the way that Paul instructs. And this brings us to the final point of the sermon. The truly spiritual person bears their own load. The truly spiritual person bears their own load. Paul knew the temptations that come with caring for other people. When you help other people and they seem to be doing well and they thank you, the temptation, do you know what the temptation is when that happens? It's to grow proud of yourself. It's to give credit to yourself. The temptation is to find worth in your own results of what you do rather than why you do it in the first place, which should be rooted in your identity as a child of God who was saved by grace. And in the rest of this passage, Paul gives two reminders that will help to fight against such temptation. Look down at verse three for the first reminder. If anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Why does Paul say this? Why does Paul tell us what to do and then give us a warning like that? He, warn, he wants the Galatian Christians he's writing to to remain humble. Paul is saying if you're too self-centered or self-absorbed, even when you're helping other people, you will not be able to bear their burdens in the way that Christ meant. You'll view yourself as more important than other people. You'll view them as lower than yourself. And if you view others this way, then you won't have a pure heart when you try to serve them. It's when you think of yourself more highly than you actually are that you're swayed by the opinions and the treatment of others. If you have no problem serving others on the outside when things are going well, when they're thanking you, when you're being noticed, but you begin to complain when your work goes unnoticed or you feel unappreciated, in reality, are you bearing that person's burdens or are you adding to it? More than that, are you doing it for the praise of God or yourself? Do not forget that the Christian is filled with confidence, not in himself or herself, but in Christ and what he has done for them. As Jesus says in John 15, verse five, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, instead of growing proud in yourself, Paul says in verse four, if you look down with me, to test your own work. And then your reason to boast will be in yourself alone and not in your neighbor. If you're following along and you read that, you're going to think, wait, wait a minute. Isn't this going against everything else he said in Galatians? Didn't he say we can't work for our salvation? Didn't he say it's by grace alone, faith alone? This feels like the exact opposite of what Paul has been saying this whole time. Isn't boasting in yourself the same thing as being proud of yourself? Well, the key to answering this and to figure out what it means is found at the end of our passage. Look down at verse five for Paul's second reminder. For each will have to bear his own load. Paul is saying what's more important than simply doing the right thing and helping other people is where you personally stand with God. He's saying don't take pride in how other people grow because of what you do or how they flourish because of what you say or what you do for them. But watch over yourself. Watch your heart as you serve. Do you see the risk of taking credit for how other people are growing? When you take credit for others rather than praise God and thank him and remain humble as Paul encourages, you fall to the temptation 
of justifying yourself based on your own works. You attribute your spiritual maturity not based on what God is doing in you, but what you think you've done in other people. And that's a scary thing, that we can lead other people to Christ without having Christ ourselves. Pastors like myself, we can preach sermons that lead to the salvation of people without having Jesus ourselves. The teachers here, they can be patient with you. They can be faithful to you in discipling you and teaching the things of God without running to Jesus themselves. And you, you can serve others to the point where they would say you served well. They thank you. But deep down, you may not be loving Jesus yourself. What Paul is saying here is make sure your heart is rooted in loving Christ. Why? Because at the end of the day, you're going to answer for your own life and no one else's. You're going to have to bear your own load before God. This is what it means to bear your own load. To bear your own load is to take responsibility for your own life. We are all responsible to carry our own load, which is quite different from a burden. A burden is an unbearable source of suffering, whereas a load is something that requires personal responsibility. Cross seeds, bear your own load. Christian or non-Christian, we're all going to come face to face with our creator one day. And when we see him face to face, we're going to answer for everything that we've done. All the good, all the bad. God's not going to discuss with you what other people are doing or what they've done, but what you've done. He'll talk to you about you on that day of judgment. So take your personal walk with God seriously and think deeply and carefully of how you want to spend your life and what it means and what it looks like to bear your own load. Don't compare yourself to others. Just because you're doing better than someone else on the outside, it doesn't mean anything. Everyone leads different lives. Everyone comes from a different place. You go to different schools, come from different families, have different personalities, different sins you struggle with. And so we all have different loads. As a pastor, part of my load is to prepare sermons each Sunday so that our souls will be nourished with God's word. If there's a teacher here, your load is to labor and toil with joy for the spiritual well-being of your students. If you're a student, your load will be to figure out how to live as a Christian in your day-to-day life, not just on Sunday, not just on Fridays, but every day of every week, every year of your life. And if you don't know what that looks like or how to do that, then I want to encourage you to talk to your teacher or pastor on how to do that. How will you carry your load this week? Now, if you're familiar with the gospel or if you've been following along, there might be one problem with this encouragement to carry your own load. We can't. We cannot carry our own load perfectly. Just think about today. Or just think about yesterday or last week. Or if it's hard for you to think about something you've done wrong, just think about your whole life. Has there ever been a moment where you slipped up? Then you can never carry your own load perfectly. What hope is there for us who cannot bear our own load? It's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ He bore the load of our sins, God's wrath, the load of the cross, so that for those who trust in him, they would be blessed and they would have eternal life. And the reason we bear our own load now is not to receive God's blessing. It's not to receive salvation or eternal life, but it's to prove that we've already received it, and to respond as a way of praising and thanking God for what he's given to us already. I'll close with this. Everyone 
wants to belong to some sort of community. No one likes being alone or left out. Whether you like this church or not, I think we can all agree, everyone wants to fit in somewhere. Everyone wants a community that's loving. Everyone wants a community that's patient with them. Everyone wants a community that bears their burdens and restores them when they're in sin with gentleness. But such a community can exist if people aren't willing to bear their own load or to bear the burdens of others. Crossseeds, we can't expect to have this sort of community laid out by Paul without putting in the work, without doing this ourselves. So let's be a truly spiritual people who care for others while remembering humbly who we are in Christ. Let's pray.